This podcast includes graphic depictions of true crime cases and may contain explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. everyone and welcome to a new episode of we saw the devil this is robin this is jackie and tonight's episode is going to be courtesy of hbo hbo was kind enough to reach out to us and offer screener for the first three episodes of its new documentary series i'll be gone in the dark and it's a six-part documentary based on the book i'll be gone in the dark by michelle mcnamara If you recall, Michelle McNamara is a brilliant writer, and she wrote the book basically documenting her civilian investigation into one of the most violent criminals America has seen. Uh, She ended up dubbing him the Golden State Killer. You may know her as well. Her husband is Patton Oswalt, comedian. And it basically just covers and documents her obsession with trying to find the man who terrorized California between the 1970s and 1980s. But before we get into that and discuss it, we would like to do a shout out to our executive producers. And again, these are our Patreon producers. If you haven't checked out our Patreon, please check it out. It's patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. And there we offer a variety of benefits, different tiers, including merch, a shout out, t-shirts, random true crime gifts, swag, swag, (laughs) access to a a private Patreon only Facebook group that is hot and popping. Afterthoughts. Afterthoughts episode. Add free episodes, more importantly. And for those of you who have noticed that we have since been monetized, it seems as though our ads, completely out of our control, are being placed at random throughout our episodes, sometimes cutting us off. I have put in a ticket with our host. So again, apologies for that. That is currently out of our control. Thank you for sticking with us through that. Yes, thank you. So again, thank you to our executive producers. That would be Ashley M, Brittany S, Christy K, Christy R, Faye, Ian, Iris, Kathleen, Leanne, Shauna, Tamara, Ilana. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We super, super appreciate it. And also shout out to all of our other patrons. We love you. We love you. So before we get into it, don't forget to check us out. If you don't follow us on Twitter at We Saw the Devil, Instagram at We Saw the Devil Podcast, Facebook at We Saw the Devil, and We Saw the Devil.com. So let's talk about I'll Be Gone in the Dark. This episode will be covering episodes one and two of the series, and they are titled Murder Habit and Reign of Terror. So let's start with first thoughts on episode one, which also premiered last night. Murder Habit. Episode one is directed by Liz Garbus. Uh, What are your first initial thoughts, Jackie? My first impression is the opening. The opening is beautiful and modern and the music score is just, it it brings you in. It it just, it's emotional. And I love that this is a compelling reimagining of her journey as a writer, as somebody who considers themselves a citizen detective, as somebody who is sleuthing through a case that seems forgotten by towns of people who were once terrified. This is one of the most beautiful documentaries I have seen, and I can't even express how long. The, the music is just so sweeping and appropriate. I think so. And I think it's endearing in a lot of ways, because you find yourself kind of getting immersed into the, the episode very quickly. I find that a lot of, you know, the true crime things like Dateline and stuff can actually err on the same side as always the same. This takes it, there's a literary sense behind it, but it's not too much. It always stays in the perfect neutral zone of entertainment and serious. I, I don't find that it does any disservice to her memory at all. And it, you can just see Patman Oswalt, like in the first episode, his, the, his love that he has for her. And that how he just wants to try and bring you through the journey that she went through with her. And it has, if you've been following this case closely, and I've been following the East Area Rapist case for over 10 years. 
I found it on the pro boards. I followed it on Reddit. I've, I mean, literally almost every day for a decade, I would check in on Reddit and see just theories or speculation, any any potential news. And when Michelle McNamara's book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, dropped, I immediately purchased a copy, uh, physical as well as on Audible. Her language and just ability to discuss terrible, terrible crimes and humanize the victims, but yet tell such a chilling, compelling story, it just was mind blowing. And, you know, I had known who Michelle McNamara was. People have discussed her very frequently across true crime message boards and forums and and whatnot. And then she also had her very popular true crime blog. Michelle McNamara has been almost like a personal hero to me. Just, you know, her brilliance as a writer, her undogged determination of trying to solve this case has been just completely amazing to watch. And it was devastating when she passed away unexpectedly before her book dropped. I say that it's devastating because not only was she a great writer, she immersed herself into the crime. You know, even in the beginning, she wanted to be there. She wanted to have an accurate retelling so that way she can just control the the reader and really draw you into the facts Mm -hmm. through the dirty, through the gritty, and you all feel it together. Her her similes and her metaphors are just so gorgeous. Yes. And, you know, and, and what makes it so real is the fact that she would go to the crime scenes. She would relive it. She was the epitome of somebody who was so deep in it and so in love with what she was doing mm-hmm. that she even showed up when she found out about the Jenner case. Mm-hmm. No, she absolutely, you know, lived it. And, and that's part of the series. It's the, the narration is in her own words. You know, as you're going on this journey through this documentary, the narration is her own words, her dis- from the book and her describing what she was doing, how she felt, how the search was impacting her family and herself. And it's interlaced with more information of from players, right? So Carol Daly, Karen Kilgariff of My Favorite Murder does a cameo, uh, Billy Jensen, Melanie Barbeau. We have a whole bunch of interviews with people who knew her, uh, assisted her with research or those who looked up to her. And it's just, it's so personal. The entire documentary is so personal and does an amazing job at showing her legacy on this case. But simultaneously, it actually tells you starting from point A, more or less, I would say it picks up after Visalia Ransacker Mm -hmm. and after the court of a cat burglar and starts really at the East Area Rapist portion of the man who would later be determined to be Joseph James D'Angelo. You know, it starts at East Area Rapist and it starts telling you his crimes and describing it, you know, interlacing her words with shots of her visiting the crime scene or, you know, current shots of the of where these crimes took place. And it tells the story of Sacramento and from the 1970s to 1980s. And it is so ungodly terrifying. What what I really enjoy is that don't you feel like it's so relatable when we went on this journey to find out information about East Area Rapists going through the forums and sleuths. and We became sleuths, right? We're constantly sleuthing. In the show, you really feel like if you're one of the people like us and you really want to know more information about something, you were, walk- were walking in her shoes. Mm-hmm. And that's what's so amazing about this is that it just reaccounts everything and it well documents. But the second you think you might get bored is the second that you end up being thrown into the East Area Rapist. You're emotionally invested. And typically, it's really hard to get emotionally invested in, you know, documentaries and stuff like that. Usually it's just like, oh, I want to know more because I'm curious. But no, this is more like you want to know because you are emotionally connected to her story, to his heart, to the, the soul of what happened to these people and the mm-hmm. victims. I'm sorry, it's just like, I'm not trying to gush too much or anything like that, but I've just never seen anything like this of production value before. Oh my God, no, I I really haven't either. And you learn how she met Patton, how they fell in love, how they got married. And, you know, it even relates to how she got interested in true crime and tied into becoming a writer. And the production value of this documentary blew me away. Now, if you recall, back in like 2018 is really when the East Area Rapist stuff on television and TV shows really got going. Like Oxygen did what, like a 4,000 hour series, it seemed. Yeah, it was like it kind of re-emerged. 
out yeah. of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Before he was even caught or captured. Yeah, it's just this huge resurgence of East Area Rapist um, pro- television programming happened. And I've seen everything on this case, and it does not hold a candle to this documentary. So again, you know, just before we start actually discussing the meat of the series, please do yourself a favor. And if you are interested in true crime at all, if you've even listened to our first two episodes of our own series about the Visalia Ransacker uh, cases and Cordova Cat Burglar, like where he got started before he he evolved into the East Area Rapist. The beginnings of an ass. Yeah. <laughs> of a terrible person, right? Like, a beginnings of a terrible human. He is, he's horrific, but definitely do more research on him, and it would just, it will make this documentary so much more impactful. Something that is incredible about this documentary is that he had so many victims. I mean, we're looking at a man who committed at least 10 murders, 50 plus rapes, and hundreds of home invasions and burglaries. This is my case. This is the case that I've been most obsessed with my entire life, hence why I love Michelle so much. Kat Winters is one of my favorite authors, and she's written multiple books, and she really just kind of outlines it with information from police reports. When you read about this and all you're reading is victim number 12, victim number 17, you're not really getting the full story. And what's so incredible about this is that you have one-on-one interviews with survivors of him. You know, there's a a person on site interviewing them and then it immediately kicks over to Michelle's narration. And it just draws you in and provokes these feelings of horror and sadness and shock. One, One of the things that I think that serves her memory well is the fact that not only do you get to know about Michelle McNamara, you get to know more about why what she was doing actually had a purpose. It led up to the capture. It did. And you know, what's really interesting is that she was like, I believe in DNA. I believe that one day the DNA is going to tell the story. I believe that I'm going, I'm going to do everything I can to capture this guy. He was so terrifying. He would terrorize his victims for so long. Mm-hmm that they didn't want to come forward anymore. They were over it. They had many reasons, so many merit amount of reasons as to why these victims did not want to be interviewed, Mm -hmm. why they didn't want to talk. She did such an amazing job connecting these people to the real world. Well, here's the thing is that Michelle McNamara gets a tremendous amount of hate in a lot of forums online, in the pro boards. And people are always like, She was so far off. She had no idea what was going on. Joseph James D'Angelo wasn't on her radar. That may be true. However, I'll Be Gone in the Dark came out before his capture, and it put a, a, a spotlight on this case. It got people interested again. It got people asking questions again. And what more can you ask for when it comes to a criminal, an unsolved criminal case? Granted, you know, Paul Holes, Carol Daly, a bunch of people who had worked countless, you know, probably thousands of man hours on this case. And they all give McNamara a good bit of credit for bringing, you know, light and onto this. So I understand, but she really did have a leave a huge mark on this case. And when you think about East Area Rapist, she has almost become just completely synonymous with it. And for good reason. When we think of East Area Rapist, or at least when I think of East Area Rapist, a lot of the time we think of all the detectives that pour all the hours into it and try to bring out the truth. But nobody ever speaks out for the victims a lot of the time Mm -hmm. in a human way. And it tells their story, you know, who they were, what they were into, what their family was like, what their interests were. And she did that. And and in the documentary, Billy Jensen spoke to how much she personalized the victims. One of my most fond memories that I have of this book is when Robin decided to play the audio. Well, we were on the Golden Highway and Robin decided to, she was like, you gotta hear this. You gotta listen to this book. This is incredible. Some one of the most incredible things I've ever heard. And so she puts on, I'll be gone in the dark. We're going through Visalia <laughs> first when I turned it on. And then we ended up going through Sacramento. Yeah. And then we end up going through Northern California at that point too. We listened for hours and I, I have to say that it was so much, it was just so immersive. All I could do was imagine that he was on that same highway that we yeah. were on. When it takes you to it, and it was just so appropriate, you know, being on the Golden State Highway and knowing that he traveled from Sacramento to Visalia and back and forth. It was just absolutely crazy. We talked about it. We were just like, I bet you he's been in the same lane at some point. Who is he? Mm-hmm. Who is this monster? 
let's let's talk about some of the spine chilling moments in in these two episodes. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to give away a lot of spoilers because this is something that it is an experience. And you know, honestly, we've reviewed films in the past, and there are certain movies that just evoke such a strong visceral reaction. And I cannot even begin to express how you need to experience this. Again, thank you, HBO, for sending the screeners. You know, I was sitting here at my computer with a set of headphones, and it just, the world literally could have ended around me. We could have been hit by an asteroid, and I would never have cared or known. I mean, that's how engaging this is. One thing that I find to be the most notable in all of this is how we, not only, as I said earlier, not only are we finding the emotional tuning of our ears onto the victims, but we are also hearing these first time reaccounts of witnesses, of people who literally work so close to this case that we never even knew before and rare news reports. That, that is worth it. That's worth it because now you have the culture, you have the setting, you have the surrounding. Mm -hmm. This is, they did such a good job with, with bringing it in the time, the ages and talking about how women were literally led to become victims in a lot of ways. And, and it's because for the first time women were allowed to work alone, to live alone. Mm -hmm. And before it was always expected that they had to live with a man. You weren't allowed to even have a bank account by yourself as a woman or be on a mortgage or have insurance as a woman, right? By yourself. That was unheard of. So they wouldn't do it. They actually legally wouldn't do it. This brought out this very interesting period of time where a lot of these rapes were happening. There's a change. It was a change of times. Mm -hmm. And there was an adjustment period. And I love that they actually talk about how this impacted women. They address the victim shaming that takes place of how they came out with these, you know, kind of warnings of how to protect yourself, how women can protect themselves by not catching the eye to become a victim. It's in the second episode, they actually mention it and they called it invitational behavior. Ladies don't have invitational behavior. And it's a woman saying this and she describes, you know, what you're, what women are wearing. Make sure that your windows and blinds are shut if you change or, you know, don't go window shopping late at night. Make sure you park close to wherever you're going. Don't stay out late, though. And it's just seeing the culture of the 70s and how women were relegated like, to these kind of sad safety behaviors of being like, well, my body is what made me a victim. And don't you dare get undressed near that window because you're just inviting And then God forbid, if something did happen to them, you know, due to this culture, it it stated that cops would show up to the crime scene after a woman's been assaulted or raped for hours, brutalized for hours. And one of the police would say, well, at least he got the prettiest one of the two sisters. Sick. So sick. It's just so disgusting. And then you have the victims themselves who went through this traumatic experience. And God, Linda O'Dell, one of them, discusses her shame. And, you know, why did he pick me? What did I do to catch his eye to bring this on myself? It was just devastating. So much self-loathing of being victimized. Yeah. And Chris Pedretti, she was uh, victim number 10. And I believe that she was 15 years old when EAR raped her. And what happened is she was playing piano and her parents were gone. She was sick. She had a cold. She was supposed to go out and she didn't. She ended up staying at home and she was playing piano. And she's playing piano in the zone. And then all of a sudden she she feels a presence and she looks up and she's met with a knife at her throat. EAR took her outside to a picnic table, tied her up, you know, went in, did his thing in the house like he normally does. And he ended up taking her in and out of the house over the course of two to three hours, raping this 15 year old girl. The way that it's shot, the way that it's narrated, the way that it's discussed, her interview, it is I was on borderline tears and I've heard her story a handful of times, but this documentary is just so incredible. It's personal. It's so personal. And then later on back to the the victim shaming part, you know, she's talking about how she was on the phone with one of her friends after the attack, a couple of weeks after the attack, and she's confiding in one of her best friends 
about what happened to her and her dad apparently picked up one of the other phones on the line and she talked about how she got into so much trouble for telling someone what happened to her, her best friend. And she said that that was the beginning of her shame. That was the first time she felt shame. And so I feel like in like 2020, you know, between 2018, 2020, when he's when we discovered who he was and the, the surge happened of interest in this case, we can't even begin to comprehend all of the the cultural implications, the nuances like we can't comprehend what it was like for victims at that time. No, not at all. And as you said, in 2020, it's really hard for us to li- relate what it's like to be told. Well, I mean, it still does happen in other countries, right? In other parts of the world that if you're dressed a certain way, you're just asking for it. And it still happens here too, to a certain degree. It does happen. Mm-hmm. It's much more rare now because social acceptance of being some an independent woman has become more embraced. And I love it. And now we're in the post Me Too movement. I'm really curious if there's going to be a backlash to it or if this is going to continue. I'm hoping that it just keeps improving. This documentary does such a good time of creating the setting, the cultural, physical setting of where these crimes took place. And I love that Melanie Barbeau has such a big part in this. And if you're not aware, she's not mentioned in a lot of places or a lot of research blogs, but she was another civilian detective and she went by the name The Social Worker. And she ended up hooking up with Michelle and they corresponded. And then Michelle went to go visit her and Melanie took her around to all the crime scenes, you know, took her place by place by place. Here's the house where it happened. Here's the alleyway. Here's the river. And Melanie grew very close to Michelle. And so I really appreciated her insight into all of this because she knows pretty much everything. And what I also found interesting is, like I said, uh, a woman would be victimized. She'd be raped in her home. Police would come on the scene and there would be no female detectives, no female members of law enforcement. And occasionally Carol Daly, bless her heart, would show up. And, you know, multiple people talked about how wonderful Carol was to them. Like a mother figure. Like, exactly. They used like a mother figure. It's, it's really interesting because you, we don't really know what it's like. Not everybody knows what it's like to have to be on scene as a victim witness mm-hmm. when a rape happens or a murder or attempted suicide or someone's even trying to attempt suicide, right? The, Usually nowadays, someone from victim witness comes and tries to counsel them to take care of the victim Mm -hmm. or the person in the act of, right? It's standard now. Back then, it wasn't standard per se. It wasn't Mm -hmm. per se, per standard procedure. It was more like, well, if we have it, you get it. More than likely, you probably won't get it. They would make these women, after being victimized, sit in the same place for hours. For hours, not let them go to the bathroom not let them obviously change anything. They would literally be sitting there after having been raped. By strange men, more strange men. And they detail that. More strange men telling them what to do Mm -hmm. in their house, disturbing it, changing their environment, no control. It's sick what a monster can do to somebody and change even people helping them and how they feel. And that's why I've never understood why East Area Rapists as a whole hasn't gotten the media coverage that, you know, the Dahmers, the Bundys, Gacy, and, you know, the rest really make it to mainstream canon, you know, mainstream culture. When he was just, he impacted so many people. The first 15 rapes were single women, women who lived alone. The rest were couples. He would actually attack couples. What happened was that the, the newspaper printed that he only attacked women who lived alone. And so what did he do? The next one was a couple. And it, he almost challenged law enforcement. He would involve men. I mean, we've, I'm sure everyone is aware at this point, but he would break into a home. He would case it out meticulously, break into the home. He would startle them, shine a flashlight, have a knife or a gun, and then he would have ligatures and he would have the woman tie up her husband or boyfriend. And then he would set dishes on their back, balance it and say, if I hear anything, you know, any noise from these dishes or them fall, I will kill, cut off an ear, whatever. So the men were literally rendered helpless, usually in their bed. And he would always take the women out into the living room, family room, another bedroom, hallway, whatever, um, to attack and assault them. Further proving how toxic the culture was during this time, one of the male survivors being interviewed talked about and insinuated how, you know, his wife was raped. He said his defensive mechanisms made him black, you know, block all of it out. 
but that even some of his best friends insinuated, well, I would have done more. You know, almost like emasculated him for not having protected his his wife. Well, don't forget the guy who saw the bicycle and everything in that one particular instance of, of a run-in with the East Area Rapist mm-hmm. where there's a bicycle involved. They're like, why didn't you shoot him? I would have shot him. Yeah. We don't know how we respond in the case of an emergency. And that includes men, you know, and it's, it's very interesting how it goes both ways of how it hurts everybody. Mm-hmm. That, that kind of um, that stereotypical culture of, that, of the times, you mm-hmm. know. It did. It impacted so many people. It impacted the women, the couples, their family, their children. Oftentimes it ruined the marriage. I can't even think of, you know, but maybe two or three out of 50 couples who even made it through it, married still together because it's so hard to constantly be in the presence of someone that you suffered such trauma with, almost like a constant reminder. Amongst other things, you would obviously. think it'd bring them together forever. You always imagine the survivor story of going through like a crazy, hectic journey with somebody, and you're bonded together forever with that. And that's not the case for some of these victims. A lot, and actually, that that has continued on to modern day. I did a little additional research for this episode just because it it literally inspires you to to google everything to learn more about everything and a huge percentage of relationships do not last and end rather abruptly after say you know one of the spouses is raped or assaulted i i think what's great is that the embedded emotions of love and remembrance for michelle's legacy mm-hmm. i think is really like a really great viewer read more or less one of her, one of the quotes that I love of how they describe her is that she leads the reader through an act of discoveries. And I think that they did a wonderful job with leading us as a viewer through the act of discoveries mm-hmm. of how she discovered, how she became, how she stumbled upon all this information, why she is who she is and why, what made her so incredible and so driven. Her mm-hmm. commitment to this case is what created her Mm -hmm. it it became her she it was her yeah i mean it's just it's just really incredible and so it'll fit great information about michelle stories really personalizing her and then back to the east air rapist an interview with victim number 23 larry crompton the detective of contra costa county I've read a lot by him and I've he his name is on everything in this case if you've been at it and researching for a long time and he talks about one of the most interesting pieces for him the time period because technology wasn't the best every you know for the most part everything was still written down how because he hit so many different random places the jurisdictions didn't work well together he would go into say Sacramento or Visalia and you know, offend multiple times, it became a big deal. And then he would move. And then the new jurisdiction, when he started offending there, would be like, well, you can't catch him. Well, we will. We're not going to share anything with you. It's just the competitive nature of policing back then is that they didn't share anything. There wasn't camaraderie between these departments to catch somebody. It, it's territorial mentality. Yeah. And, you know, I believe that a lot of police districts are sort of like that in some ways, but I don't think it's like how it was i think they share now of course for the greater good so something else that this documentary did so i've always known that the east area rapist now known now we know him as joseph james d'angelo was one of the most prolific criminals that the united states has ever seen 50 rapes you know 10 murders so on and so forth what was shocking to learn uh, from larry crompton was that he wasn't even the most active and i was like what like record scratch back the back the train what in the world 50 rapes is a lot and then crompton went through a list early bird rapist the stinky rapist (laughs) yeah i'm sorry no the car key rapist the pillowcase rapist and then back to the stinky rapist what was insane about this to me is that Crompton mentions that police knew who he was, but didn't file charges. Now, the stinky rapist was based out of Berkeley, and he started raping women, and police knew who he was, but the DA refused to file charges. And police tracked him as he moved from Berkeley to Oakland, and he kept, and then suddenly rape started spiking there. What in the world? And so I decided, I'm like, I have to look him up. 
I just have to look him up. So I looked up the stinky rapist and then I find Carolyn Craven. And Carolyn Craven was a black woman who worked at KQED TV in San Francisco on the show Newsroom. She reported on the stinky rapist, a serial rapist known as Stinky, because he apparently had terrible body odor. He committed at least 60 rapes. She reported on him frequently, giving the updates, because again, he reoffended more than EAR did. He, the stinky rapist, actually ended up breaking into Carolyn's house. He subdued her, blindfolded her, and raped her for over two whole hours. And Carolyn realized, due to the smell, who he was. Oh, no. And so she started using her hands and feet to feel his body to see if she could pick up on any sort of clues as to what he looked like, what he was wearing, what his body felt like. That's so brave of her. I know. And she tried, she made the mental notes and then went to police to report it. And she, because of this, she actually, she wrote a book and toured the country, constantly telling and retelling her story over and over and over again, and urged rape victims to come forward, telling them that they shouldn't be ashamed, that it's not their fault, that they need to come forward and report their attacks to police. And she even went on, her story was so inspiring that she went on Good Morning America, and they actually aired a week-long series on the rape crisis. And so, like, you know, little things like that, just I never in a million years would have found that if it weren't for this documentary. And strong women like her who changed the volume of how people handle rape and how women are also viewed after rape. Mm -hmm. This documentary has so many, so much information packed into something that is just incredibly engaging. It's terrifying, too. And, you know, back to the production, side note, the production value. In episode two, it actually starts with um, hypnosis, like hypnotherapy. Oh, my gosh. It's <laughs> so, like, I, I can't even tell you. I, I, I want to interject here and just say that the breakdown of the recollection of events and the hypnosis is just, like, amazing with the music. Oh, my God. I needed an adult. <laughs> I can watch true crime and go right to sleep. It does not impact me. It doesn't freak me out. It doesn't, you know, frighten me. I can watch it morning, noon, or night. But they're showing hypnotherapy. They're they're playing a record of hypnotherapy with one of the survivors. And between that, the background music, the voices, it's just, there are multiple moments in this documentary that were terrifying. Oh, it just drags you through the, her memories so vividly, too. Mm-hmm. And this is just a witness. This isn't even a victim. This is just a witness. Mm-hmm. And you just feel, with her word choice, how real it is. Mm-hmm. How real all of it became. And she's just like, my hair was standing up. Mm-hmm. And you feel it. Everything that is translated and like kind of transcribed in this entire series so far, I just feel feel it and I usually don't feel it feel it when I am looking up anything true crime I'm like oh that's terrible or I feel so bad for the children or something to that effect but this is every one of your emotions is being strung along like really great writing would and I think that's the whole point and I think that's what's so beautiful about this is that it serves Michelle McNamara's it it rewards her hard work and and, in memory of her legacy Again, massive, massive, massive props to the entire team behind this. Again, we've only, we got the screener for the first three episodes and I just, I want all of them. HBO, (laughs) and please send the rest. I can't wait. Massive props to the whole team behind this. And, you know, thank you so much to Patton Oswalt. I'm sure this was hard for him. He's repeatedly said just M- Michelle was the absolute love of his life. And so, you know, there are multiple times where you can tell on screen, you know, he was vulnerable with his with his emotions and, and sharing things. And the team as a whole, Liz Garbus, uh, director of episode one, and Elizabeth Wolf, director of episode two, just incredible work. Just such incredible work. I feel like this is a collaborative gift. I can't imagine the pain and grief that he has gone through with the loss of Michelle. Mm -mm. And I think it's endearing. I think it's striking and I think it's compelling. And I've, 
It's very rare to see a literary view taken with serious facts about a monster. That simultaneously weaves that literary component with hard facts in a true crime documentary and does it so beautifully. And for those of you probably have no idea, Liz Garbus is by far probably the most well-known director attached to this. But she also did another documentary called What Happened, Miss Simone, which is a documentary about uh, Nina Simone. And if you've seen it, it's currently on Netflix, but it very much does the same thing. Her work is incredible. They couldn't have picked a better person to do it, though. No. Period. In fact, I, I would say the same thing about the producers, too. Who, everybody who worked on this so far, incredible. It really is. And I cannot wait to see the rest of it. I mean, I may read this book for a third time now, just to, to, just to experience it again. I want to say one thought on this, and that's really important to highlight, is that I'm not an easy sell at all. We've watched so many documentaries about East Area Rapists. We, mm-hmm. We've tried to, we, we've done our sleuthing ourselves, okay? I remember when he was found, saw it live on TV and everything. And I will say this, I'm not an easy sell when it comes to true crime. Yeah. I find most of them boring, to be quite frank. And that's okay. I know a lot of the our listeners love it. And that's great. I'll watch it because I have interest in the case. You know, I want to know more. This is not a straight up documentary about East Area Rapist. Disclaimer, right? If you're going into this expecting an A to Z just encyclopedia of Joseph James D'Angelo as the East Area Rapist, that is not what you are going to get in this series. Like, full disclaimer there. This is about Michelle McNamara's journey and her citizen detective work and how she approached this case and investigated it and gave ungodly amounts of time to this case. So this is what you should expect going into this. I give it two toe tags up. Yeah, no, it's like more tags. So far, it is damn near perfect. So far, yes, absolutely. So far, it is damn near perfect. It has a great balance and the cinematography is great. So that is it. Do you have any additional thoughts, Jackie? I, I want to compel people to listen to this when they're watching it. To, to If they have the opportunity to watch it on their computer or something or have the, a way to listen to it with their headphones, just do it. Do it. Immerse yourself so deep in this because you will hear everything. Especially it, for episode number three. The, I, I want to give I want to give credit to their editors because oh, it, everything's just so fluent in this. It's crisp. It's clean. And it looks beautiful. No, it's absolutely gorgeous. And one of my favorite aspects, and it's terrifying, is that every time they start to tell or start to interview a survivor and tell their story, there's this amazing shot of darkness and shadows creeping across the grounds or over a home. And it's just the- how it pulls up to them, too, and introduces the family or the, you know, the victims is just so captivating. It is just the production value as a whole. The photography is just so gorgeous. Again, what Jackie said, backing that up, if you have a set of headphones and you can watch this on your computer, say H- HBO Go or whatever, try to watch with a pair of headphones and you will be doubly immersed. That is our review of the first three episodes. We did not want to give away spoilers because, again, it's based on the book I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara. You can get that any retailer, any bookseller, pretty much anywhere. But um, again, big shout out. We are so grateful to HBO for reaching out to us and offering us the screener to this. It's it's an honor and privilege. Yeah, Thank it is you. an absolute honor and privilege. And, you know, being such a fangirl of Michelle McNamara, it was like, really? Are we serious? I was so excited. Oh, we were both just screaming. Yeah. In joy. We're like, are we serious? Seriously? Because we really enjoyed the book. So thank you for sticking around with us and listening to our review. Yes. And we will be reviewing the rest of the series as it airs and eventually getting to our own episodes continuing the East Area Rapist series. So again, you can find us on Twitter at We Saw the Devil, Facebook at We Saw the Devil, Instagram at We Saw the Devil podcast. And again, if you want to support the show, feel free to check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil, where for as little as $3 a month, you can back the show and get a series of benefits, private access to our community, ad free episodes, early release, and merch. Join our family. We have a really great community going. A lot of discussion happens. We'd love to have you. We have a lot of sleuths. 
in our Patreon community, and we are breaking down the Lori Vallow case. I'm pretty sure we're almost FBI level at this point. So again, guys, thanks so much for listening. Until next crime.